Hey everybody, welcome to episode 70 of the Go Get Outside podcast. This is your host, Jason Milligan. Welcome back. Welcome aboard. On today's show, we will be doing a different type of roundtable than those we've done in the past. We will be speaking to Leela Higgins, Richard Smart, and Miguel Ordeñana of the Natural History Museum of L.A. County about their community science program. This is a program that attempts to crowdsource science and include the public in their various research projects by making it possible for the public to gather some of that data and to participate in their research. I think it goes without saying that including people in a process tends to make them more excited, more interested, and more likely to learn and be educated by that project. And as a personal proponent of the sciences, I figured it would be great to bring this information to the show here. A little heads up for those of you not in the Los Angeles or California area, we will be speaking about the community science program specifically here in Los Angeles, but I encourage all of you to look into your own communities and see if there is something similar. And if there is not, perhaps you could begin contacting the various organizations that do exist in your community to see if it is possible to get one started in your area. So without further ado, here is our conversation about the community science program at the Natural History Museum of L.A. County. everyone. I'm Leela Higgins and I am senior manager at the Natural History Museum and also a huge lover of the outdoors. Grew up in England on a farm, used to pretend to be a badger in hollow trees, love traveling, going all over the world. Hi guys, we got our camp kids out. Yay, adventures in nature. Make some noise, you're on a podcast. (laughs) Yay nature. Yay out of doors. Yeah, so love traveling with my friends to places they grew up and seeing the places all over the world where you can just have outdoor experiences. I studied bugs, so insects are totally my jam. Howdy, I'm Richard Smart, and I'm a manager of the community science program at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I originally grew up in Texas, been in Los Angeles for almost six years, and I really love it here. But it's interesting, I really felt like it wasn't until I was in college that I really really, truly connected with the outdoors. So it's really neat for me to be a part of this podcast and have a job encouraging people to get outside. Hi, I'm Miguel Ardignana. I'm also a manager in the community science office. I grew up here in Los Angeles, actually right across the street from Griffith Park, which is one of the biggest city parks in the country. Even though I did grow up across the street from this big wildlife oasis, I really didn't interact with nature like Richard until I was basically an adult. I would go to Griffith Park for exercise, for barbecues, to get on the trains and the pony rides or the zoo, but I didn't really know what I was looking at or really connect with the wild things that I was seeing. Being outside was basically for recreation and exercise rather than now it's for that, but also for nature exploration and research to some degree. And I have a background in mammal research. Some of my research focus is in carnivores, in the urban environment, and also bats as well. That's another way I'm connecting to nature in the outdoors. So everybody here comes from disparate places, and you've all kind of been unified together at this one place, which is the Los Angeles Natural History Museum, where we are right now. Do you guys want to explain to the audience a little bit about this museum and why they should care about it? Firstly, it's amazing, and the museum's over 100 years old. Right now we're sitting in the Nature Gardens, which is a three and a half acre site that wraps around the museum. This 
used to be parking lot, lawn, and like some really biologically inert planters. So most of the time you'd see honeybees and maybe a hummingbird and maybe a pill bug, but that was about it. And now there's all these native plants all around us and lots of amazing wildlife that we found. And Miguel's set up camera traps here in the gardens. We've done overnight campouts here. We've had kids coming for the first time and literally never camping ever before in their life and never having roasted a marshmallow and we've sat there roasting marshmallows around a fire in the garden and I've got tears streaming down my face while the kids are like what is this crazy woman doing? <laughs> But I would say, because um, I was hired right as the museum was celebrating its 100th year anniversary, right as our nature gardens were about to open, the nature lab was about to open. Honestly, like if the museum hadn't shifted and changed their outdoor space to create this beautiful garden, I don't think we would have a job here necessarily because the museum was really focused, started focusing on connecting people to their local outdoors. Citizen science, as it was then called, now called community science, was formalized. I was the first coordinator hired at the time, so I really feel like the museum hadn't shifted to start thinking about how can people participate in science, particularly study urban nature that three of us wouldn't be here today or at least not together that's right i really had a totally different experience and connection to the museum growing up i actually would come here as a very young kid because my mom went to school at usc across the street she was raising me by herself at the time so she would come to the museum because she knew i liked animals and very convenient for her to just to kind of let me roam through the museum and enjoy myself and it really fed my passion that i really can't explain for wildlife i've had a passion for wildlife from a very young age and my mom did what she could to feel that passion and the museum was one of those places going through the taxidermy halls african mammal hall north american mammal hall those are all still the same but it's amazing for me as a wildlife biologist urban wildlife biologist to find this museum relevant i would have never considered this place as a place to do research or outreach education for local nature if it was the same museum that i grew up going to as a kid it's changed so much just like richard said in the past a little bit over five years because of all this focus on our gardens, basically rewilding this property that way and also connecting people to nature through indoor exhibits like the Nature Lab, which really tells a story of not just that LA is biodiverse, but why it's biodiverse. I think that's really important and then also other cool temporary exhibits like the P-22 exhibit, which is a famous mountain lion that lives here locally. And so for me, it makes it more relevant. I feel very happy and proud of this institution because of that, because when I was a kid, I almost kind of fell through the cracks with regards to finding my path or career in the wildlife field or environmental education field because I didn't really connect with nature. There wasn't really any institution or organization that was really telling people to look for wildlife here in LA. People were saying, oh yeah, wildlife exists, but you have to go to the zoo or you have to go to Africa or the Amazon or Yosemite. And for me, as a kid growing up, my Yosemite was Griffith Park. I didn't even go to the Western Santa Monica's that are just west of the 405 till I was a, a young adult. It's really great that there's organizations like this really telling people to embrace nature and different ways to enjoy it and interact with it so that people can interact with it on their own terms and the museum Nature Gardens are a really great first step to get people comfortable around nature, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, one of the interesting things I've noticed from talking to a number of different people is perceptions have kind of changed. There was this idea that there were urban areas, which were for people, mm. and then there were wild animals, and they were for animals, and they should never intermix, and they should fear each other. And within the last few years, maybe more, it seems like it's starting to shift, especially here in Los Angeles, to recognize that those two worlds can mix together, and by doing so, they actually can benefit each other. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially as people have been studying wildlife and really letting people know what their behaviors are like, what their ecology is, using really relatable stories to connect people to those species has allowed misconceptions to go away for some of these species. So like arthropods, insects, spiders, the museum and our entomologists and educators share all the really great benefits of having these arthropods around. People really respect them 
more. For instance, if they're gardeners, they see their relevance in that way. Or if they have insect problems in their house, they see spiders as a really cool resource to have around the house or around their property to eat those pests that they see as pests. For me, I study carnivores and bats, which have a lot of myths and misconceptions and are very controversial species. And so I'm really excited about any opportunity that I can have to share the real facts about these animals based on scientific research, not based on what my grandmother told me growing up or what my neighbor kept telling me. It's about research that colleagues are doing and just starting to do in the city and really sharing that in fun ways and unique ways through exhibit spaces or through just one-on-one -on -one interactions. I like how you kept saying arthropods because you're <laughs> such a mammal guy. I like that you're talking about insects. But I would say in regards to like wildlife and urban being separate, really cool part about our job is getting people to see that everyday nature is still wildlife and is of interest to science. So whether it's a squirrel, whether it's the hummingbirds that we're seeing around here, that nature that they see every day is nature. Nature doesn't just exist in the wild, whatever that may be, or like right. you know, the mountains, the deserts. It doesn't so have forward. to be separate from your reality, a Correct. place you go. Your everyday reality. Right. Well, we are nature. We're a species along with all the others. Admittedly, we are a pretty dominating species. I was doing a program for some camp kids at LA County Park on Friday. They'd wanted me to talk about insects, so I took some drawers of bugs, and I was like, guess how many species of insects there are described in the world? And one kid's like, 200. And another one's like, 300. <laughs> and then one kid thought he was being funny. He's like, 1 million! <laughs> And I was like, well, actually, you're really close because it actually is a million so far described species. Again, if we're one species, there are a million described insect species. And that's, you know, the work that natural history museums do is we keep these repositories. You know, we got almost six million insects in our collection upstairs. Where else in the world but at natural history museums are we studying the nature, the wildlife that lives on this planet? And over the last couple of decades, there's really been this shift to start studying the nature and the animals and plants that are living in cities. More people live in cities than not in cities in the world today. And cities are getting bigger and more and more cities are coming into being. And so if we don't study the nature that's happening in cities, we're really going to be messing things up more than we already have. We should be studying nature in the cities and trying to figure out how to use that data so we can build cities that work better for humans and wildlife into the future. And I think that's a lot of the work that's happening here at the museum in the new Urban Nature Research Center, which we're all part and parcel of. And yeah, it's great working with some of the other scientists in the building who are studying reptiles and amphibians. So working with our friend, Dr. Greg Pauly, and then our entomologist, Dr. Brian Brown, and our snail and slug scientist, Dr. Jan Vandetti, finding species in LA that had never been here before, so introduced species, or finding rare species that we're not sure if those snails and slugs are still around anymore. We get to work on those projects and invite people to the museum and then meet them in their neighborhoods, in their own communities, to really say, no, it's important. We don't know. Our scientists and us, we can't be in your backyard looking for snails and slugs or reptiles and amphibians or squirrels, but you guys can, and you might find a species that's not been found in LA before. You could become a public author because this information is important that scientists want to know. We got like so many stories of that from around LA and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, so you've started talking about it a bit, the community science program. One of the great things about museums, of course, is that they can present all this information to people, but what makes that information even more valuable is when you can include those people in those projects. So could you guys explain what the community science program is here and how that came about? Well, it came about because of the garden we're sitting in right now. I started at the museum in 2000 and and eight, you know, a few months after I started, I heard about this project, the Nature Gardens project, that three and a half acres were gonna be turned into this amazing wildlife habitat space and space for visitors to get up close and personal with nature. And I was like, I wanna work on that. That is amazing. This is what I'm interested in, finding nature in the city, connecting people to nature in the city. Monarch butterfly is like literally flying over our heads <laughs> right now as we're talking about this story. It's amazing. <laughs> We made that transition when this garden was happening about we're going to start doing programming outside and what is that programming going to be? One of the only educators working on that team for the Nature Gardens, they said, Leela, what do you think? And 
I had been working on citizen science. Again, now we call it community science, but back then we were calling it citizen science. And I was like, we can get regular people involved in doing real research. And we have scientists and researchers in the building. We'll have this brand new site. That's what we should be doing, getting these hands-on experiences, informal science experiences, time outside of the classroom for kids, for adults, for tweens, all ages. As you heard earlier, you heard the Adventures in Nature summer camp kids coming by. We've been doing that program for I think it's like 30 years or something but community science is something that's a little newer and again it's really hands-on really getting people out into the wildlife around LA and using their smartphones most of our projects include the smartphone app by naturalist and taking pictures of what they find so then we can really start to study it and document it I think that that's again one of the aspects of, of what we do but I think we do a lot of work partnering and working with community orgs to meet people where they're at decrease any of the barriers so people can participate easily and we're not 100% barrier free will we ever be I don't know but I think that that's something that we're really conscious about and really try to work towards and that's one of the reasons we changed the name the term citizen science is not inclusive and in and itself can be a barrier it was really great that the museum supported and really pushed for that name change and working with people in the community having people like Richard and Miguel in the office who really believed in that and pushed for that as well is really important. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little about the how-to on participating. I really feel like that's one of my main roles on this team is the education, the communication of that. Because as Leo's mentioned, most of our community science programs, people participate through their smartphone. So I'd like people to think about if they've ever taken a photo of a wild animal or of a plant that they saw growing, whether that animal or plant was interesting, they thought it was beautiful, maybe they thought it was strange, they saw a weird interaction. Those were the things that we want people to take photos of. We want people to take photos of what they see in their everyday lives, so going back to that everyday nature, things you see in your backyard, things that you see at school, at work, if you're going to church, if you're going shopping. Take them with your smartphone and then share that digital photo with us. And like Leela said, we try to decrease barriers. So the number one way people could participate is through downloading this app called iNaturalist and adding their photos to our projects. But if someone doesn't want to download a new app, they can email the photos to us at nature at nhm.org. If you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can hashtag at nature in LA. So you can already upload it to the apps that you have, or you can even text us your photo. So we really try to meet people where they are when I first started, I kept pushing iNaturalist and sometimes people would email us a photo and they said, oh no, like you post it for me. And I was like, there's this great app, but you know, some people are only going to participate once or twice. They're not quite sure that they want to download this new app that they don't know anything about, we decided to start offering multiple ways to let people participate. So email, social media, iNaturalist, and texting. And the text number, just so people have it, it's 213-663-6632. And is this strictly for people in the Los Angeles area, or is it open to people outside of Los Angeles as well? Southern California, really. Three of our main projects cover the 10-county Southern California area, because we are our Naturalist Museum of Los Angeles County, and we spend most of our time on our outreach education side around here. But if you live in Riverside, you live in San Diego, you can participate in our snail and slug survey, our Southern California squirrel survey, our rascals project, which is reptiles and amphibians. But you can use iNaturalist anywhere in the world. That's true. And so <laughs> That's I think true. every time any of us go on vacation, we're oh, like, yeah. oh, why don't you get on iNaturalist this time? <laughs> I found amazing six spotted burnet moth, which is like bright bluish black with these really amazing red spots on it. You can tell she's the entomologist. When I was in Geneva for a work conference <laughs> and it was just such a beautiful, amazing find and these amazing stink horn mushrooms too. And I don't know, what have you guys found lately on any vacations or adventures around the city? So last night I was at Oro Vista Park, which is in Sunland on the edge of the Verdugo Mountains. And I was actually going through the Tunga Wash for the first time. It was actually water going through there even though there's been so much intense heat lately. And I was finding bats flying overhead, insects, sign of coyotes. And even late at night, not late, but like 8.30 p.m., which is late for daytime active lizards, I was finding them in pitch black darkness just still hanging out on the concrete, like western fence lizards and whiptail lizards, which was really cool to see. Do you think... Because it was so hot? It was so, yeah, I think because it was so hot, the heat that was radiating for the concrete is still 
really, really warm. As a person that lives yeah. in that area, I can verify that it has been very hot. <laughs> <laughs> Heat wave. Something that I'm really proud about about this program and this institution is that we're always looking for places to grow. When I first started here, our program was always kind of interested in expanding our programs, the type of projects that we offer. And so when I had the idea with a colleague of mine here, Jim Dines, a mammal curator, to start a squirrel survey, our program, our institution was all about it because the story behind the eastern fox squirrel is very relevant to the museum, but also a very tangible story to Los Angeles. To give you a kind of quick summary, the eastern fox squirrel was introduced in the early 1900s by Civil War veterans in Sawtell Veterans Home, which is in West LA. They brought these squirrels over either as pets or as food, and the government employees that working at the veterans home found these squirrels and said, we can't be giving them table scraps. That's a misappropriation of government funds. And so these veterans released the squirrels and they started spreading all over the place. And we had a big orchard industry at the time and they did a lot of damage to the orchard industry. But by that point, it was too late for anybody to get rid of them. They've been spreading ever since in all directions. Our museum collections have been able to document that. And so to use kind of updated methods for data collection and to involve the community, we thought it would be a great addition to our list of research projects to add a squirrel survey. Also because we didn't have a mammal survey at the time, we just had a reptile survey. And so having a mammal survey really made our work more relevant to people that may not be as interested in reptiles or snails and slugs as they are into mammals. The other part of the story is that there is a conservation concern related to our native tree squirrel, which is the Western Grey squirrel. And there may be a direct correlation between the expansion of the eastern fox squirrel, which is more aggressive, more bold, and more urban adapted, entering into western gray squirrel habitat, which is a more shy species that's limited to cooler oak woodland type of habitat. There's a combination of habitat loss affecting this native tree squirrel as these oak woodland canyons are vanishing from the landscape and also the eastern fox squirrel displacing them behaviorally. So having people using their phones, during their lunch break and taking a picture of that pesky fox squirrel that's always eating their sandwich at lunchtime is just a really cool way for people to interact with nature that like they never had before. Instead of that squirrel just being the squirrel that everybody sees during their lunch break, it's now, oh, it's part of this story that I just heard about from the museum. And it's part of this really interesting research study that I'm involved in and my family's involved in now. So I think it's really cool. But another relatable story is the P-22 story that I'll tell you quickly. We have an exhibit dedicated to this animal because it really is a tangible story that's relatable to anybody. So this P-22 story is about a mountain lion named P-22, which stands for Puma 22. He represents the 22nd Puma ever studied in the LA area by the National Park Service. I was fortunate enough to discover him using a device called the Camera Trap, which is a motion activated camera that a lot of researchers use. And I discovered him studying Griffin Griffith Park with some colleagues of mine through a project called the Griffith Park Connectivity Study with the help of friends of Griffith Park. And we put cameras on the borders of the park to see if Griffith Park was an island or not, see if animals were able to get in or out. We were just hoping for wide ranging animals like deer and coyotes and bobcats to be able to cross in and out and be captured on camera to prove what corridors are actually working and which ones aren't. And so we were monitoring these potential corridors for a while got our answer. Deer were crossing in and out, which is great. But then in February 2012, a mountain lion popped out on one of my cameras and I was in total disbelief because as I said, I grew up on the edge of Griffith Park, coming to this park and using it for a lot of different reasons, but never expecting that someday a mountain lion would ever be there. Even as a researcher, knowing about carnivore ecology and studying that as my area of specialty, I'd never have anticipated that. Kind of that's a testament to how adaptable some species are and how understudied some species are. After that discovery, I shared it with the Park Service. They captured the animal about three weeks later. They took some blood samples as part of the process, and that allowed them to link him to an individual named P1, who's the first puma ever studied, who lived his entire life west of the 405. So if you don't know where that is, generally, that's about 53 miles from Griffith Park. And in between west of the 405 and Griffith Park, there's the 405 freeway. There's a bunch of urbanization that includes Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Laurel Canyon, Runyon 
Canyon and then you get to close to Hollywood and Studio City, then there's the 101 freeway that's right in the way. He had to cross that to get into Griffith Park. So basically linking him to that individual P1 meant that he was born west of the 405 because he was the only male that lived out there and all the population that was being studied at the time was living west of the 405. So P1 was west of the 405, P22 had to be born west of the 405. And then he's been a lot of misadventures since then have been great learning lessons for local carnivore conservation related issues. But at its core, this story is about the potential for coexistence, the potential to rally behind a very controversial species through a really tangible story. And so this story really is about breaking down barriers that that are seemingly insurmountable. And I think anybody can relate to that. So people that visit the museum from local places here in LA or that are visitors from another country can relate to this story and really help them understand how special LA is as an important place for nature and a unique place for nature. To give you some perspective, having mountain lions here makes us one of only two mega cities in the world that can say they have big cats living within their city limits. The other is Mumbai. And so I think this story is a really creative way that museums can really connect people with local nature. And that's just one example. So the last thing I'm going to say that I'm really proud of as far as always looking for growth and ways to get better, it's not just about expanding our research, expanding what we're studying and how we study it. Yes, we are doing that too. We have some very talented researchers here that are really making some really great headway in making community science research really strong from a research perspective and getting past a lot of these scientific barriers like error and things like that. People that are not as confident in the reliability of community science really focus on error and we're trying to get at that. But from our perspective, something that I'm really proud of is that we're really trying to make it more relatable to a wider community. And we're doing this by acknowledging our limitations and by acknowledging what partners are out there already in the existing community and with even the LA County government that can really be really invaluable partners. And some of those are LA County Parks and Recreation. Some of those are LA County Libraries, which have a huge reach throughout LA. And each of these individual sites whether it's a park or a library, have really strong bonds to those communities that the museum may not have. And so part of community science isn't just saying, hey, this is really important to understand biodiversity, but first create a relationship with those communities and then start talking about the relevance of biodiversity. And I think by partnering with libraries and parks, we're able to do that. By changing our name from citizen science to community science, that's another big move. That was not an easy decision to make because the general experience accepted term is citizen science and so you're kind of going against the majority by doing this in our field in our field field. excuse me yeah and so what i respect about doing that a lot is that we're not just changing the name to seem like more relevant we're taking it as a call to action for ourselves by changing our name to community science from citizen science we're not only getting at the obvious which is that science and what we do here is not just for people that are citizens of this country but also in addition to that, it's a call to action ourselves to make sure that we remind ourselves that for this to be a sustainable program, we have to always think about the community when thinking about our next move and making sure that the community is involved in a lot more aspects of the process of community science, not just, hey, we got to participate for a day and that's it. That's our role. Sometimes people want that type of easy and quick interaction, but some people are looking for more. And if we're going to call ourselves community science, then we have to make sure that the work that we do is really in partnership with the community. It's really true. That's where our heads are at. And that's where we're going towards. We're not there yet, but we're also acknowledging that as well, that the work that we've been doing is great, but it could be better. We have some very tangible steps, I guess. That's not the word I want, but tangible steps that we can tell people that we're using as our ways. And we're always open to suggestions and how we can do better. Yeah, one of the things I like about the concept of this program is you can introduce people to information all you want, right? And that can be valuable. But once people connect with something, they can develop empathy for that thing. And then they start to sincerely care about it. People listening might think like, okay, we can take pictures of squirrels and you can send it in, big deal. But just like you were saying, Miguel, is that squirrel then doesn't just become that pesky squirrel that everyone sees at lunch, suddenly it be 
becomes a member of their community in some sort of extended way. And they start to develop a relationship with that squirrel and then another squirrel and then animals beyond the squirrel. And then we start to see how we interconnect instead of just thinking of us as the lords over everything mm. that we yeah. exist alongside. <laughs> And I would like to build off of that in the sense of when participating in our program, one of the ways that people participate is that they're just curious what it is they're seeing. They don't know what type of plant they're looking at, what type of insect, sometimes which species of squirrel. So when they participate in our projects, they can begin to learn the name of that organism. And I think that also builds empathy because I remember one of my mentors back in Texas, he said, to know the name of the animal that you're looking at is to begin to see its value because you no longer see it as just a critter, a creature, something to be scared of. You may now know that is a European garden snail. That is a Western fence lizard. Maybe that's all you know, but you begin to differentiate it from just an amalgam of of wildlife. And I think that really is another part about our program that sometimes we don't talk about enough is that people are getting that educational knowledge and beginning to learn a little bit more moving along that spectrum of what it is and identifying the nature in their backyard again. Do any of you have examples of seeing change in children or adults who have become part of these programs? There's so many stories. There's so many stories. Which is great. I remember taking a group out for a family field trip to Piru Creek. So up the five. There's a lot of bugs there. Really great space for aquatic insects because it's a creek, obviously. And there was this little boy. His name was Diego. I had my insect net there and we were catching dragonflies and damselflies. And we caught a whole bunch of insects and we put them all into this little cooler so they didn't get overheated. And then at the end of the program, we went through all of the bugs and we helped to identify them with the people. And we let them all go and we're like, bye bye, dragonfly, bye bye, butterfly, etc., etc. So they all were free to go back and live their lives in this space. For this tiny little damselfly, neon blue, what we call flying neon toothpicks, I had lifted it out and I said, okay, Diego, do you want to let this damselfly go? So he said, yes. And I put it on the tip of his finger. Damselfly kind of moved around a little bit and then flew off. And you could see the giant wide eye look of wonder that Diego had. And he turned to me and looked me in the eyes and said, wow. I love nature now. Nature's cool. (laughs) And I was like, that is exactly what we're trying to do here. These are the experiences that we're trying to help people have. We're trying to facilitate those experiences, taking people to new places they hadn't been to before. I'm sure we have so many stories of tide pooling down in San Pedro, people seeing baby octopus for the first time. A sea hare for the first time. A giant sea hare (laughs) holding this giant slug in your hand and the giant wide-eyed wonder look. That's one of my number one stories. What about you guys? Let me just say mine quickly because I actually have to leave, unfortunately. I have a couple, but one that I think is really great is part partnering with a local school called Esperanza Elementary School, who have also have a great principal. His name is Brad Rumble, who, similar to us, like we did to our property, they rewilded their campus by tearing up concrete and putting a lot of plants and great habitat for wildlife so that kids in this school that's literally right under the shadows of the skyscrapers of downtown are more connected with nature and think about nature more. And so going out with them and bio-blitzing them, they've also come to the museum and we've taken on walks through the garden and having repeat visits with these kids and sometimes when they come here to the museum they have their families with them showing their parents how to look for wildlife skills that we've taught them of how to not just know how to do bird watching and identify plants but how to stop look and listen for different types of wildlife especially insects that are harder to see or are not in the front of your mind or tracks and sign for me like if I see scat or or if I see feathers, or if I see a footprint, those are things that I look for and that I teach people to look for. And those are just easy ways to connect with nature. So having these repeated interactions and coming to them and them remembering me or remembering Leela when we come or, or Richard, getting evidence that we have a lasting impact on communities and from a perspective that's really personal to me. And then the last thing I'll mention is related to the community science name changing is coming here with my own family and being able to explain what I do for a living and name my department without feeling uncomfortable anymore. 
I used to feel uncomfortable talking about what I do and using the word citizen science because a lot of my family members are either recent immigrants or have a really strong connection with the immigrant community. So being able to do this and not saying it was my decision only to change the name because of my concerns with the name, it was actually thought of by other people but for the same reasons why I cared about it, even before I even started stating these issues. I think all of these ways of feeling more comfortable sharing nature with people and having evidence of lasting impacts and people running into me, especially young kids, especially kids of color, talking to me about science or saying, you're the P22 guy or that's P22. You talk to me about P22 and telling me about the story or correcting my knowledge on the story sometimes. <laughs> that's really what I want to see and that's my ultimate goal, to have a more diverse next generation of scientists and environmental educators from a gender perspective, because I have a daughter and there's not enough women in the field, but also from an ethnicity perspective. We need more Latinos, more African-Americans in this field to, to make this museum more relevant and relatable to people. Yeah, the, the museum has been doing a lot of work on inclusion, diversity and equity. Miguel's on this group that's a National Science Foundation funded program called iPage and Miguel and a cohort from the museum have been doing that. And it's really, really great to see because I know that we talk a lot about these things in our office, but now this whole program is to get institutional change because you can't, you can only do so much when you haven't changed your internal culture to be more inclusive and have more diversity and more equity. You can't really change all of the way you work and the way you work with communities and programs unless you're really doing that work internally as well. Miguel kept saying he's proud to work here and proud of the things the museum have done. These are things that I'm really proud of, the fact that we're going through that process. So what are some of these projects that people can get involved with? We've talked about a few of them, but let's give people a broad spectrum of ways that they'd be able to get involved beyond the iNaturalist app and the sort of projects they could choose to become part of. There's a lot of things I want to talk about, but one place you can always go, you can go to nhm.org slash nature. And on our website, you can learn a lot about our projects, a lot about our educators and scientists working that we collaborate with. And you can also learn about some of the different outreach events that we are participating in. But to go back to a project that people can participate in, I love our LA Nature Map. It is, in some ways, our gateway project. It covers the five county greater LA area. And with that, people can take a photograph of any type of plant or animal that they see throughout the five county greater LA area. So it's not taxonomically specific. The range is very large. It can be animals that you saw in the past that you're curious about or that you want to report about. So if you have photographs of wildlife from a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, you can add them to our project. I like that because it gets us a good snapshot of the types of things that people see. Because some of our scientists, of course, they specialize in different taxonomy, but this one has everything. And so it's neat to see all those different observations in one spot. People's photographs, once again, become a data point in this project. Your photo can be a data point that's used by our scientists because iNaturalist is open source. Other scientists and educators can use your data point and can add your data point to their project with your permission. So it's neat because we've had people uh, Lepidopterists, butterfly scientists. Speaking of that monarch, some monarch scientists called me about two years ago and they wanted to know like some of our monarch data and I directed them to our LA nature map because we didn't have a monarch project at the time, but there they could download all the monarch observations by our participants with location and date information and it added to their data set. So it added information to them. So I really like that, that people's photographs can become a data point right now in the project and possibly even a data point in a future project. For me, like whenever I've talked with people, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier regarding people connecting, when I say data point, I've seen like that click in adults, probably adults more than children, but definitely both, where people think like my photo of a butterfly is a data point and they're questioning it and they're kind of processing it. So we try to repeat it and we try to be like, yes, you, know, you can be a part of this scientific process through at least this first step of data collection. A big thing that Leela and I have talked about ever since we started and definitely have had lots of conversations with Miguel is a lot of people know just aren't comfortable with science and definitely aren't comfortable with urban nature. One of my friends, I'll, I'll never forget this. She came to visit me at the museum. She walked into our office. She saw some scopes and we never really use these scopes at all, but we have some up there and she was intimidated to walk in. And then when she saw that, I remember her, she was, oh my gosh, science. And she, she was getting nervous. Like, yeah, she like had her hands over her chest, yeah. intimidated, yes. And I thought this is just, you know, our office. It doesn't even look like a lab. It's not a lab. 
I try to take that lesson for me, like, for her to even think, can I be a community scientist? She would say, but I have anxiety when it comes to science. I cannot do that. So to have such a, what I perceive as a low bear and what I hope it is a low bear of taking a photo, something that people are already probably doing on social media and posting it or sharing it with us is a low barrier of participation, but it is participation in a scientific project and scientific research. And I think that's important for people to understand, for adults and kids to understand that when we say community science, Science and you are a community scientist, you are truly participating in this project, in this scientific project. Our scientists, Greg Pauly, Jan, Miguel, Brian Brown, they cannot get these data points from your backyard. They cannot go into your backyard. They don't have the access. They don't have the capacity to go into everyone's backyard. So we need people to tell us what's in your backyard and to document it because you're the experts in your backyard, in your neighborhood, where you live, work, and play. So we need that information shared with us. So the LA Nature Map is a great way to start. We do have more taxonomically specific projects, but I think if you can start there, then everything you see can be open and can be photographed and shared. Yeah, there's so many projects. We have so many projects. Instead of just being involved, you know, through use of an app or something else, are there things here at the museum that people should come certain days of the week, uh, weekends, where particular community science programs that they can participate in are happening? We do programs throughout the year. We do a lot of programs off-site because our wildlife nature gardens have been pretty well surveyed. We do things here once in a while, but we really like to go out in the community and meet people where they're literally living. We've done tide pooling down at San Pedro Point Furman. We do that many times working with our scientists in the marine biodiversity group here at the museum. We go to a lot of county parks, like we've been to Eaton Canyon, we've been to the new Stoneview Nature Center. I think we've got some coming up on the list right now, like Whittier Narrows and things like that. So we've got lots of great spaces up in the mountains. Again, there's all these different projects you can participate in, whether it's our snail and slug project, Slime, whether it's the squirrel project, or whether it's the reptile and amphibian project, any of those can be participated in the whole of Southern California. But then we have special events throughout the year, and then we try to have gatherings during those events so people can meet up. So there's this one called the City Nature Challenge. And this last year, it was the third year that it run. The first year it was LA versus San Francisco. And which city could find the most nature? People went out. People came to events at the museum here and in San Francisco. And how much nature could we find? All together, between the two cities, we got over 20,000 observations logged during that week, which was amazing. And then all these other community science practitioners around the country were intrigued and wanted to be involved. So then we really grew the program and it was national in 2017. So 16 cities across the United States, over 250,000 observations that year, which was really spectacular. Then this year it was 68 cities around the world. So it's gone global and it really I think again goes back to this idea of what is happening in nature in our cities and museums and naturist museums and programs like the City Nature Challenge and Community Science are really good ways to involve multiple people to help answer those questions and to help us connect people with nature and then connect scientists with the data that they need to start understanding what's going on with nature in our cities. And I want to talk more about the City Nature Challenge because it's the phenomenon I would describe of going from a two-city competition, a friendly competition, not knowing what to expect, and then to over 65 cities internationally competing is amazing. I remember after the first one, when we were celebrating over 20,000 observations and the fact that Los Angeles one beat San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, we get um, to mention that all the time. Have to mention it. <laughs> San Francisco beat us this year, though. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. But I remember, Leela, you and I were really excited and you said people understand a competition. You know, when we talk about our project, sometimes we have to explain what community science means, explain what urban nature means, explain what a bio blitz is. You know, there is lots of jargon in our field, but City Nature Challenge, when you say it's a competition between cities, people get that because it happens with Super Bowls, it happens in World Series. People already understand this context. And so we get a lot of people who only participate during the City Nature Challenge, but they definitely look forward to it. And they send us lots of different photos. So I really enjoy that time period. It's a lot of work on our end, but it's worthwhile because it is getting people out there to walk around and take photos and to participate in a really cool community science project. 
One of the things I think a lot of people say sometimes is like, oh, I'd like to spend more time in nature or I want to take the kids somewhere, but I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And I think programs like this could be a nice place to begin because they don't have to come up with the ideas and they're contributing in some capacity, which can lead to then further contribution elsewhere or just kind of open up their eyes to all the other things available to them. So let's tell everyone again which websites to go to. Let's let them know where the Natural History Museum is in case they don't know. And uh, let everybody know where they should go to start getting involved. So the, the museum is located at 900 Exposition Boulevard. We're in Expo Park. We're right next to the Coliseum and the California Science Center and USC. It's right off the Expo line. So really easy to get to on public transit, which is fantastic. We have so many different programs that you can come to. Go to our website www.nhm.org slash nature and then you can look to the community science tab although the museum is redoing its website so if the website's changed just <laughs> google search naturalist museum of los angeles county and community science and it will come up we also have a blog that comes out about once a week about nature in la that multiple scientists and educators here at the museum write so yeah the website's a good place to get a lot of information yeah. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is Nature in LA. All right. And so before we wrap it up, one of the things I like to do at the end, and I apologize if this puts anybody on the spot, uh, no. <laughs> but what I always like to ask is if there's something we haven't covered or some final thought you want to leave people with, and then we'll end the show with that. For me, this museum has given me so many opportunities to go on so many amazing adventures in the out of doors. And it's really personally fulfilling. And I never would have thought, I didn't know that there was such a thing as entomology that I could study as an undergrad. I had no idea that I could become a scientist. I had a science teacher when I was a kid who was like, Lily, you're really good at science. You should study science. But I didn't think that I'd ever actually do that as a job. And so getting to work here at the museum and do amazing things like all the programs we've talked about earlier, but then get to go on adventures like collecting giant spiders in New Orleans for our spider pavilion exhibit, or going to Arizona for an insect conference in the middle of like the Sonoran Desert. That's pretty amazing that the museum sees that as a thing that we should be focusing on and giving me those opportunities, but then also giving other staff in our office those opportunities and then transferring that professional development to our public so we can provide better, more amazing programs. I just want to emphasize again to people listening that your observations matter. They matter to us here at the museum, to our community science program, to our scientists who have their research projects up there. But we truly do care about your observations of wildlife. We cannot see what you can see. So please take your photos, please share them with the museum, and we look forward to seeing them and communicating with you about what we think of it and what you saw and having some more conversation. And meeting you at one of our programs. For sure. And if your kids ever come to you and they say, mom or dad, I'm bored, I don't have anything to do, hand them a phone, open up that app and say, go in the backyard and take pictures of the insects and animals you see back there. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we hear a lot of parents say, I don't feel guilty having my kid use a digital device for this. They feel like it's a really valuable skill to have and actually a good use of digital devices. It's beneficial. So with that, I want to thank you guys for coming out here. And please thank Miguel for me since he had to leave and go to his fancy meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. So yes, getting involved in the community science program is indeed as simple as taking photographs of the flora and fauna in your own area and sharing them through the internet. I'd like to encourage you all to head over and download that iNaturalist app or to go to the Natural History Museum website and see how you can get involved in these programs. A reminder for all of you that P22 Day is later this month on October 27th. If you are in the Los Angeles area or you intend to be, it might be a great day to head over to Griffith Park and find out about P22. 
And now would be a great time to head over to our brand new website, gogetoutside.com. If you listened to the last episode, you heard me speak profusely about how it has been redesigned and drastically improved. And so now is a great time for you to go experience that for yourself. Gogetoutside.com. Look for this episode 70 the Community Science Roundtable, and there you will find numerous photographs of our guest in action, as well as a multitude of links. Links to the Natural History Museum and its community science programs, its various social media outlets, a link to the Wild LA book that they will be publishing later in March 19th, and personal social media links to the various guests on today's episode. And if that is not enough time on the internet for you and you would like to get in touch with us here at this show, you can always send us a message at go at butcherbirdstudios.com or you may use an antiquated telephone device and call us up at 818-925-0106 and leave us a voicemail. And if you would like to do me a personal favor, please head over to your podcast purveyor of choice. Subscribe to this show, rate it, review it, and share it with someone who you think would like to get involved in community science in their area. This episode of the Go Get Outside podcast was edited by Griffin Davis. It was produced and recorded with additional editing by me, your host, Jason Milligan. We would like to give a special thanks once again to Rosalind Helfand for helping make this episode happen. And as always, this has been brought to you by ButcherBird Studios. Next time on the show come back October 16th. This is one I think many in the Southern California canyoneering community may be looking forward to. We will be speaking with Freddie Unger and this episode will be a little different than those in the past. Oddly enough, we will be speaking about a topic that hasn't come up yet on the show that I recall. We will talk about what it's like to deal with substance abuse and sobriety and how reinserting yourself in the outdoors and in this case canyoneering can in essence save your life and bring you true friendship come back october 16th freddie unger see you then <laughs>